One of my favorite parts about being a, well, non-religious is when I tell people that I enjoy watching the work of the Satanic Temple and I'm friends with Lucian Greaves. I just like to see the look on their face. Yeah, because many of these people were like I was. You're primed. You're primed to be afraid. This is a culture that is perpetually afraid, which to me makes no sense. Lucian Greaves joins me for the broadcast. How are you doing, my friend? Good. How are you? Now, have you noticed this? I mean, their God is all-powerful. Yahweh has already conquered the devil. I mean, he hasn't, like, literally, but it's a foregone conclusion. And yet, they are always freaked out, terrified about the devil, the end times, demon possession, evil in pop culture, icons, music, toys, games, music, etc. I mean, certainly you've had that observation, right? Yeah, and not only do they say they subscribe to this notion that everything's a foregone conclusion and and that uh, my side, as they put it, uh, will lose in the end. But uh, there's a certain people who want to incessantly tell me this again and again. Uh, they want to convince me of this. And I begin to think maybe they want to convince themselves. I think if you're really secure in that notion, you don't really have the need to, to keep trying to impress it upon me. You and I were hanging out in Florida when I did the satanic panic speech a while back. And I mentioned in the speech, I think you would agree, the satanic panic is not over, right? The satanic panic certainly never ended. And uh, people who are familiar at any deeper level with the satanic temple will know that we have a, a subsection of the satanic temple that is called the gray faction that we uh, use as kind of our, uh, our organized activism against the ongoing satanic panic. People look back now at the satanic panic and they kind of laugh with a sense of nostalgia at the lunacy of these claims that there were backward messages and heavy metal music and that Dungeons and Dragons would lead you to uh, smoking pot, cannibalism and, and Satanism. And the, the fact of the matter is, though, is there, there was really nothing funny about it. This moral panic really ruined people's lives, sent people to prison. And even though sociologists kind of date the end of the formal satanic panic as being around 1995, all that really happened then is that it kind of fell out of mainstream media favor. You didn't see daytime talk shows uh, propagating these notions uncritically anymore, these notions that there was a satanic cult conspiracy that was again and again uh, practicing ritual sacrifice, cannibalism, using mobile crematoriums to get rid of the evidence and that this was something we needed to litigate uh, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, very actively at the time. Um, but what didn't change is that there was really no reflection within the mental health profession uh, where subsections, fringe subsections of the mental health community help really propagate these notions through recovered memory therapies and the, the notion that uh, Satanists were uh, intentionally creating multiple personality disorder through extreme trauma and abuse on people, uh, mind control plots and that kind of thing. Uh, what's horrific to find is that that subsection of the mental health community is still very much active, uh, never really... Uh, never really suffered the censure of licensing boards or the American Psychiatric Association and still essentially do what they're doing. Uh, give people crippling delusions, uh, people who are mentally vulnerable rather than um, helping them establish a real grounding in reality. And that's something we fight back against. And I think what we're seeing with QAnon now is part of what we inherited from the satanic panic and it just goes on a, uh, you know it's just part of a, a continuum of satanic panic conspiracy theories and part of the part of what's going on here is just a reckoning with our failure to rectify the uh the mistakes of the past and it's 
it's a really scary state of affairs. Uh, QAnon brings it to a whole new level. And it's not long, I think, before the people who support the QAnon conspiracy theories uh, begin to propagate the so-called science of satanic panic that emerged previously and start to embrace these theories of multiple personality disorder and the other things that supposedly prove the satanic panic from before. Uh, we're yet to see that really play out, but my prediction is that the, that's the next step. Well, you know, that book Michelle remembers back in the 1980s was a cornerstone of the satanic panic. And the whole idea was that, and this was bullshit, it turned out to be totally bogus, but that she had repressed memories of being involved in satanic ritual. And it took a psychiatrist or psychologist to sort of root those out. And oh my God, look at this revelation. We have discovered she led a whole other life that she hadn't remembered. And of course, people bought that story hook, line, and sinker. You're saying that the mental health profession is still propagating, or some people within the mental health profession are still propagating that stuff now? Oh, very much so. There's a professional organization called the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, ISSTD. They hold annual conferences, and we've sent people to some of these conferences, and they offer continuing education units, and they have a special interest group in the ISSTD uh, called the Ritual Abuse Mind Control Special Interest Group. And they'll talk about Illuminati mind control plots. They'll talk about satanic ritual abuse, all of the same old things that, uh, that were up for discussion during the, the formal satanic panic. And they believe in these things. And to a large degree, some of these people were the original propagators of satanic panic. And, you know, this is... It might not be so horrific if this were just uh, a group of uh, conspiracy theorists with like interests. Uh, then you could just say it was bizarre and, and you know, you could object to the ideas, but uh, but you, you can say much more than that. Uh, I mean, they, they do have the, the freedom to congregate and, and hold their opinions. But when you have people holding professional licensing and when you have them propagating these ideas to the mentally vulnerable uh, uh, under that kind of uh, authority of, of, of professional licensing, that, that to me is horrific. Uh, and, and that should be stopped. And that's something Gray Faction has been fighting for some time. And as I said, I, I really think now, you know, we're going to see QAnon picking up on these narratives because they're... They're short on victims, you know, they, they, they don't have real eyewitness testimony to what they're claiming is happening. When you start accepting spectral evidence, like recovered memories that people uh, got during the course of hypnosis or whatever, which of course are very unreliable and uh, the same qualitatively as those recovered memories of alien abduction and past lives from past lives or past life regressions, uh, then you know, you start developing this kind of victim's network as evidence of everything you're saying. And, and that's, that's how the original satanic panic uh, kind of took off. So uh, nothing's really changed. So all those, all those elements are in place to be, uh, be pillaged by this, this new movement. The Illuminati. It just, <laughs> what do you think? Talk about the Illuminati, right? I always say it's sort of like Spectre from the Bond films. The Illuminati, this underground organization that is puppeteering world governments and the Catholic Church and, I mean, religions far and wide, actually. They're all sort of, it's this shadow organization that is trying to promote a new world order. I don't know, I've heard different variations. Could you, in your words, how do you define when you hear the Illuminati, I mean, what pops up in your skull? To, to me, the Illuminati is similar to people just blaming things on Satan. But when it's the Illuminati, it has more of that flavor of anti-elitism, this idea that there's this cabal in the background. Uh, Satan is kind of like this primary conscious organizer of evil, whereas the Illuminati is kind of like that boardroom behind the scenes. And with QAnon, it's the deep state. But, you know, you mentioned Michelle Remembers. Uh, 
you know, it was a psychiatrist who was doing the recovered memory therapy on the woman, Michelle Smith, and helped her retrieve these supposed memories of her being abused by Satanists. And they were on talk shows talking about this. And these stories were taken seriously um, in, in mainstream in mainstream media. They, the, the author and, uh, well, the co-authors, uh, the psychiatrist and the, the, the subject co-authored the book together. Uh, they would be on these speaking tours. They were on Oprah and they were talking about this. And what was remarkable about this is even though it was presented as the true story of a bizarre kind of medical condition, multiple personality disorder, what went unmentioned on the shows was that this story said many supernatural things. You know, uh, Satan himself shows up and Michelle remembers and she's saved by St. Michael and Jesus comes down at one point and removes the physical scars from her corporeal body so that she has no real evidence uh, beyond her memories that this happened at all, conveniently. But uh, another interesting element to Michelle remembers, at least in my mind, is that the psychiatrist and Michelle, it was Lawrence Pazder and Michelle Smith, they eventually got married. And there were pictures of them in therapy sessions where he was using this kind of very affectionate cuddle therapy with her, you know, like, like getting really close and they would, they would embrace and, and lay on the couch together and things like that. Um, and you wonder to what degree they were just kind of having these kinky fetishistic fantasies. And then I went to a, a uh, ritual abuse mind control conference many years ago. And a, there was a person giving a lecture and talking about these sadistic tales of abuse that uh, almost certainly never happened because of their supernatural flavor. And I remember sitting right in front of me, there was a support person, uh, which was, I guess, the husband or boyfriend of this woman who uh, claimed that she had been abused by Satanists or whatever else. And they were getting very sexual with each other while this was being discussed. And I kind of think that in some ways, this fixation with sadistic satanic abuse and the need to talk about it at such great length and develop these really, uh, uh, really bizarre narratives about it is kind of a guilty pleasure for at least some of these people. In the church, which is a Puritan culture in many regards, you, you don't talk about this stuff. But if you are warning the public, or if you are educating, quote unquote, the public, well, now we can get into all the salacious stuff that maybe deep down we're kind of interested in and fascinated by, but we're doing it under the guise of, well, you know, this needs to be addressed for the protection of society. I mean, is that the angle you were taking? Yeah. In some, you know, a lot of people want like a one size fits all answer. So if I say this, they they're going to a lot. Some people are going to uh, consider that I'm saying that that is the motivating factor when people start discussing these bizarre fan fantasies of satanic child sexual abuse and things like that. And I don't think there's necessarily one way to these conspiracy theories. I think in some cases, uh, people really gravitate towards stories of child sexual abuse when they're talking about Satanism or when they're discussing their QAnon conspiracy theories, because on a kind of crass uh, survival level, they're using victims as human shields against scrutiny against their bizarre conspiracy theories. Um, and that is to say that once you start calling bullshit on some of the bizarre things they're saying, they immediately contextualize their conspiracy theories and their work as merely being advocacy uh, for victims of child sexual abuse and as uh, a fight against the exploitation of, of sexually abused children or child trafficking or whatever else. Therefore, if you call bullshit on 
uh, Illuminati plots, mind control, uh, satanic ritual abuse, and things like that. You, you're you're merely defending human trafficking, and, and in that way, you know, conspiracy theorists try to evade a, a lot of critical scrutiny that comes their way, and, and a lot of times it actually works. And, and I think you know, as a byproduct of that too, though, because they're able to just speak openly about these bizarre fixations they have in these fantasies. I honestly do think, and this comes out, and this isn't just my way of insulting the conspiracy theorists. This comes after many years of going to conspiracy conferences, talking to some people really deeply embedded in these conspiracy theories. I do think they begin to attract the, the latent and repressed pedophile. I want to come back to QAnon conspiracies, but let's derail for just a second, or let's take a different track. Lucian Greaves, yeah, co-founder of the they, Satanic they, Temple. I didn't mean to get so... Uh, no, no, no. No, I, <laughs> oh, that's exactly what I want from this conversation. I want, I want to talk about that stuff, because it's on... My own mother is posting wild conspiracies. You know, the Bill Gates, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Fauci... You know, I mean, there is a constant fear of the other and they're coming and they've been coming for most of her life. They're going to take everything. They're going to take your country. They're going to take your jobs. They're going to take your speech. They're going to take your freedom to worship your religion. What was it that Trump said the other day when he's dog whistling to these people? He's saying, you know, Biden's going to hurt God. And of course, you and I are like, well, how exactly like what tactic is that? Like, how does what weapon? can be used to hurt the omnipotent, invincible Yahweh. I'm, I'm stuck there. But I want to come back to that, okay? I'm going to come back. So you are a co-founder of the Satanic Temple. Are people scared of you? Uh, yeah. I, um, this, is, uh, this actually gets into territory where I don't even know how much I want to say sometimes because we have... Uh, we have a, a group of volunteers who work as my kind of uh, ad hoc security team. And, you know, for the most part, they work remotely and they just try to keep an eye on things because there's a lot of chatter, you know, and a lot of people with a lot of bizarre ideas speak openly and signal the things they're going to do. So people try to keep a track of what my threat assessment is. And, um, there really is, there really are some deeply disturbed people who have some really bizarre ideas about who I am, what I do, and especially about uh, who they think backs me. You know, to hear some, uh, some people talk about it or write about it, comment about it, you would really think I'm, uh, I'm well off within the upper levels of the elites and, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm kind of sitting on my own private island, you know, jetted back and forth or, or whatever, that I'm part of something much bigger. And I think, you know, that's just another element of the conspiracist thinking to really try to simplify things and make the world uh, much more understandable in this kind of polarized light of good and evil and knowing exactly where you're aligned and uh, whose side you're on. But also this notion that everything you're in disagreement with is uh, in collusion with one another. And of course, w with all these things, there's a spectrum where things get, you know, very delusional and then things are more kind of gray area and mainstream misunderstandings. And I think you see more of a gray area of that type of thinking when you see kind of what I consider the greatest trick the Trump administration has ever pulled, and that is convincing uh, a not insignificant part of the population somehow that the problems we're seeing, the social unrest we're seeing now during the Trump administration is what we'll get if we have a Democrat in office. To me, that's just... Uh, it's just remarkable. Here we have this, this, this unrest, we have protests, we have riots, and we have this all happening during the Trump administration and arguably 
uh, as a product of the Trump administration's failure to substantially address real social issues. And yet they're saying, this is what you'll get with a Biden presidency. I mean, yeah. I got you. It's bizarre. I, I, I don't understand how people buy that one, but it's very right, clear. So that Trump you and I have talked about this, but let me ask it again for maybe some people who haven't been down this road. Why Satan? Like, why Satan? Yeah, that's the big question that if I really had, uh, I, I really feel like I've never cohered the knockout punch answer to that one in such a way that people who don't get it will just get it because people know we're non-theistic. We don't venerate the, the idea of a, of a conscious, uh, real Satan, but Satan's uh, an iconography for us, uh, uh, the symbol of, of, uh, of rebellion, anti-theocracy, anti-authoritarianism. Uh, so the idea seems to be that we could pick anything else and we could be less uh, uh, less provocative than to, to choose Satan, which is considered insulting to some Christians and things like that. Uh, all I can really say is that, you know, non-theistic or not, these kinds of archetypes that we grew up with, this kind of cultural, artistic, raw material, really uh, really affects us. It still is something we can't walk back from. It's still, like you'll still have, you'll still see atheists who are uh, afraid of blasphemous imagery. It goes too far, you know. It, it, it goes outside these boundaries into making them feel like they've engaged with something antinomian to the point where they can't really handle it. And to us, you know, something that has that kind of power and resonates with us internally you know, as, as well as externally. And that's something a lot of people I don't think realize is that it means something to us inside. You know, it's not just, it's not just something we're projecting outward to watch other people's reactions. You know, if people see how our chapters engage with one another. They'll, they'll do, they'll do ritual things inside, you know, uh, uh, that, that aren't for an audience, that kind of thing, because it's meaningful to them. Um, you know, that's why Satan, because it is the it, it speaks directly to our values and to the, the values that we're uh, we're in opposition to as well. One of the phrases, and I may get this wrong, correct me, but you Satan for you is an icon that represents a resistance to tyranny. That accurate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the OK, we're talking the the, the milled. The Milton type of uh, the Satan, the rebel against tyranny. I mean, we're talking about, uh, let's look at the biblical Satan, and you tell me if I'm tracking. But like, he didn't choose to be created. He wasn't going to bow down at Yahweh's feet. And again, there's all kinds of conversations about the use of the word Satan or adversary in the Bible, and is Satan Lucifer, and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, you know, the common cultural notions of Satan are he wasn't going to bow down. And he decided to kind of do his own thing, got kicked out of paradise or heaven, and became God's nemesis. And so, I mean, is that one of the incarnations of Satan where you're like, yeah, he was re he was essentially rebelling against tyranny? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I'm not as interested in the, the uh, proper theological context of Satan and everything, because you can get into these debates where... People will say, well, Satan originally just meant adversary, and there were multiple Satans. And then, you know, in Genesis, it never said that Satan was a serpent and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, this is, sure, I mean, that's not a problem for me because I don't view it as anything other than this kind of literary construct that evolved over time. And, you know, we look at, you know, Paradise Lost and Romantic Satanism from, I think, the 19th century uh, is kind of like the source material for this uh, this development of this ultimate rebel against tyranny. And that really works for us. There is an authoritarian vibe to what we're seeing politically. And people respond to a savior figure. We've seen this throughout history. And I think you and I agree that many of the people who are responding now to authoritarianism have been primed 
by their religions. There is trouble, there is evil, there is chaos. I will save you. Rally behind me and follow, right? So they become, for lack of a better word, the shepherd which leads the sheep. You're seeing this today. Would you make that sort of correlation? Yeah, I've, my own feeling is that any theistic religion primes somebody for authoritarian conditioning or to accept authoritarianism. There isn't a theistic religion that doesn't, uh, I mean, by definition, it's asking you to accept something on faith without evidence because you're being told. And the nature of theistic religions is to uh, incessantly impress that upon you uh, for the most part, uh, to uh, continue to develop your fealty to these notions that cannot be proven. And you accept those on the authority of a, of a minister, a priest, uh, you know, some, some other type of character who's supposed to have some kind of uh, uh, elevated uh, link to the divine. Uh, and then dictate that kind of thing to you. They're never asked to show you the evidence for this uh, because it, it simply cannot be. Um, you, you're just meant to submit yourself to that. And of course, you're discouraged from exercising critical thinking skills in those regards. There's only, you know, most uh, most religions, most uh, most religious organizations. Most people who are propagating those notions will only accept a limited degree of skeptical inquiry into these types of things before they're offended, before you're part of the outgroup, before you're certainly not one of them, if you're calling these things into question. So you're really asking somebody to subjugate themselves to irrational ideas. And that's why I think when we see autocracies rearing their ugly heads, um, they often take on a religious flavor. And I don't think that Donald Trump really cares about religion in, in, in any way beyond what it does to help him flex his political muscle and, and establish himself more firmly into power. And I think it's very much the same with, uh, you know, Erdogan and uh, Hungary and Bolonsero and in Brazil and the other kind of theocrats within that evangelical network that are trying for their world conquest now. So there is merit to this notion that religions prime people to accept the fantastic, which brings us back to QAnon and the Illuminati and all of these sort of sinister forces, the puppeteers behind the scenes, the dark shadow people who are filling the plains with black clad looters, rioters to come and I don't know what, whatever the last claim was to bring bags of soup to throw it. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's just so much insanity to choose from, but religion primes people then to not just accept, but embrace the fantastic. Yeah. And I, it's funny, I've, I've seen these articles pop up now that are, uh, it's mystifying to me that, that the connection isn't drawn uh, more clearly in people's minds more immediately to uh, this kind of conditioning people have in, in church environments, in, in their religious setting, and what that does to uh, diminish their critical thinking skills or at least put them on hold. And that is really illustrated by looking at some of these articles on QAnon uh, discussing how churches are trying to approach, you know, QAnon believers now filling their pews and, and how they're, they're trying to uh, find ways to combat this irrationalism. And, I mean, it really started at home, didn't it? Now, now, they're, now they're telling these people not to believe this one series of of completely unprovable claims uh, because they don't match with reality, um, but they, they seem to match with some uh, bizarre uh, interpretation of their morality. And, I mean, there's just an irony in that they've been kind of conditioning people to think that way for so long, and now they, uh, and, and now they don't know how to do it. Let's talk about religion. It's funny. 
our conversations have, I think, made me change my position on the utility of religion. Now, I still go back and forth because maybe I'm a flake. I don't know, or I'm just not sure of my own mind. But I used to be like, well, all religions are damaging because I was speaking about religion in a purely theistic model. The satanic temple is a religion. In fact, you've been recognized. Is that correct? I mean, you are you are a religion. Yeah, we're okay. We're a tax exempt religion in the U.S. So, but you are. I mean, we understand historically the utility of religions to help create tribal bonds and to help people come together to celebrate common interests, even common values. So, is there merit? And I'm starting to think the answer might be yes to having something like the satanic temple or, I mean, call it whatever you want, where you're not lying to yourself or other people, but you have many of the elements of religion. You have ritual and those types of things. I mean, come on, how, how would you describe the defense of a non-theistic religion like TST? Yeah, I mean, I would just invite people to come to any of our chapters having their events or any of these gatherings that, well, we used to have before the pandemic broke out. But I think people very easily see that the Satanic Temple for people in the Satanic Temple with an active membership uh, really does uh, take on that role that a religion is supposed to take in people's lives. And there would really be no reason to say that it's anything other than uh, the religious identity of the people people in it but yeah it doesn't it doesn't care what carry with it the uh the cost of uh submitting oneself to delusion and i think that's the real beauty of it and that's the real fear of it i think too um sometimes i think when we find theistic parties really decrying our authenticity and, and demanding that we can't be seen as a religion i think it's because they they see they're the last defenses for uh, the, their worst aspects uh, completely being dissolved before their very eyes. It's uh, it's interesting, I think, listening to the, the podcast uh, Penny Lane, the director of Hail Satan, did with uh, with Penn of Penn and Tiller, where she was talking about the film, and he was really grappling with this because. Uh, you know, to his credit, he was doing his best to understand it, and I think he was understanding it, and he had seen the film. But it was so against uh, everything he had been saying, you know, for all this time. He had really invested himself in the damage of religion and, and the uh, in the notion that we should we should just get rid of uh, these ideas entirely. You know that that we should even have any any sense of religious identity without a thought that it could be useful to people in a non-theistic context and, and not subject people to, to delusion. So that's, that's really new territory for a lot of people. And it's really gratifying to me to see, you know, the different places people come from when they come to the Satanic Temple. A, a lot of people had, uh, you know, oppressive religious upbringings and then come to the Satanic Temple and they never wanted to uh, have that loss, that feeling of loss of of community, you know, and then they feel they've gotten that back, um, even though they've given up on their old religious community, but they have the satanic temple now, and they, they never thought they'd have that. And then we have people who've been lifelong atheists who come into this and feel like they didn't realize what they were missing until they had a religious identity and religious community and they didn't have to give up their reason as well and, and that is a very beautiful and powerful thing to have played the role i played in bringing people to that is always going to be i think the uh, prime achievement of my life i'm, I'm reminded of uh, like secular judaism right i mean the the uh, stats say that 50 or more percent of people in the Jewish religion have doubts about whether or not there's even a God. They are secular Jews, but they use, you know, ritual and custom based in Judaism 
as sort of a wallpaper, a window dressing, a framework for life, stuff that they enjoy doing as an expression, but it's not rooted to a lie about a god or a devil or any of those types of things. I mean, would you correlate the two? I mean, would you have that in common? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I point to that all the time. And it's, you know, it's a cultural identity. And it's, uh, and to, you know, to a lot of people, it just lends a sense of coherence to their lives. And it kind of anchors moments in time, you know, for them, celebrations, those types of things. People ask us all the time, well, what's the point of doing any rituals if you don't believe in the supernatural? It doesn't make any sense. Of course it makes sense. You still go to weddings, right? You still do funerals. I mean, these are ritual behaviors. That's what ritual is. It doesn't demand that you uh, that you feel that you're actually, you know, calling to some ethereal being from the heavens or whatever else. You know, these are, uh, you know, even pageantry. I mean, if you watch a television show and get emotionally invested in a fiction, you know, that's that's somewhere on that continuum as well. It's somewhere on the spectrum there. So I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's as beyond some people as they originally think. And I think that uh, there's just a human constant in which, you know, everybody can be enriched by this type of thing in one way or another. By the way, if anybody has a comment or question for Lucian Greaves, switchboard wide open, now's the time to dial in. So, oh, shit, I just lost my train of thought. Do you ever do that? It's happening more and more as I get older as well. <laughs> um, but I had, this, I had this question teed up. Give me 10 seconds. What was it? Oh, the ritual, though, that is tied to the Satanic Temple. It, I mean, you got, is, it, is it just theatrical by nature? I mean, what I just picture in my mind is the stereotype. Oh, look, hi, I'd like to join the satanic temple. I show up at your door and I'm naked and covered in black paint and fake blood and I'm on fire. (laughs) You're in. I mean, is is you attract a certain ilk of people or, you know, tell me how I'm wrong or right on that score. It's really changing. You know, uh, originally when we started out, people, you know, immediately thought of Satanism as being uh, just the domain of pretty much a, a certain age group of white death metal fans or goth kids or whatever. And once people really started seeing what we were about, that started changing a bit. And, uh, and you know, because I did the uh, Pink Mass and because we, uh, you know, really went hard at the Westboro Baptist Church, in defense of gay rights, um, we immediately appealed to a lot of the LGBTQ community that felt really outcast by traditional religions and really felt they they had a place in community within the Satanic Temple. And they're right, you know, still have a huge, uh, a huge membership base from the LGBTQ crowd. And the demographics more and more have been shifting to uh, show more representation of people of color within the satanic temple. And, you know, these are very unforced demographic shifts, which are, I think, obviously the best kind. You know, we have always kind of walked this balance where we don't want to proselytize, but we want to know, you know, we don't want to be missionaries about things. And it's certainly no place of mine to go into minority communities and say Satanism is right for you or that it's right for anybody. But we want people to know what we're about and that the door is open to anybody who's, you know, going to identify with it and adhere to our tenets. So now we have a big enough kind of membership base where people really have radically bizarre off-base ideas about what we are and what we'll accept and, you know, whether we're just some kind of antinomian cult that uh, that uh, engages in whatever excess they, they feel they want to want to indulge in, you know, they, they, they get corrected pretty, pretty quickly. And even the aesthetic is starting to change now. I mean, earlier on, you really could assume that a lot of us were just going to be, uh, uh, you know, black clad, 
uh, in rather goth. Um, but now you, you just have no idea. You yeah, know, it brings you to the other it's, conundrum, it's brighter right? Brighter colors coming into it. Where your people are mm-hmm. like the fans of an indie band. And man, if you're too mainstream, Lucian, dude, you've sold out. You sold out the Satanic Temple back when you were nobody, back when I had you in my back pocket, man. I was a fan, yeah, right. but now there's now you guys are mainstream. There's probably a little bit of that going on. Uh, well, that mostly comes from like other other groups, you know. That's that's more like a Church of Satan thing. Like <laughs> you're, you're ruining Satanism. That was our this was our private party, you know. Like yeah, we, we dressed in fedoras and, and put on our our Baphomet medallions on the weekends, and that's what we wanted to be, you know. And people were scared that we. Uh, that we were going to murder murder them and eat their babies or whatever. And we like that to a limited degree because we're not actually living this publicly day by day or doing anything more with it. That's that's the kind of that's the kind of crowd you get that kind of thing from. But you know, that's easy to ignore. To me, you know, uh, the less people are afraid of, of Satanism, the more people understand what it really means to people who embrace it. Uh, the better off we are. It really isn't. Uh, it really doesn't do us a whole lot to just uh, go out and scare the neighbors and, and you know anger our family members and things like that. Um, if you have people thinking about Satanism differently, uh, maybe they think a little more clearly about their own behaviors when they uh, try to create scapegoats and outcasts. If we can take away a primary scapegoat from them you know, and get them to actually think about what's going on around them that will have done the world a service, I think. That's interesting, too. You know, somebody might be a declaration of being liberated from fear, right? I used to be terrified. Now, hey, what the hell? Let's treat him like the mythology he is. Let's see what our listeners have to say. Five, four, one. Hi, you are on with Lucian Greaves. Who's this? Hey, yeah, this is Derek in Oregon. Um, Longtime listener of the Thinking Atheist. Thank you. Uh, I'm a card carrying Satanist uh, member of the temple, and my family is incredibly fundamental and very religious. I have never, I guess, I guess the term would be, come uh, come out to them. How do you how do you handle talking to your family about something like that, bringing it up for fear of being completely uh, vilified by them? I get that question a lot. And honestly, I think it would be the responsible thing for me to get everybody else's story about this. I, I you know, after this, I think I'm going to go on like Twitter and just ask people for their stories of coming up because this is something I don't feel I can really speak to. Um, everybody knows where I stand. Everybody knows where I am. And the people who aren't going to speak to me anymore because of this thing that, you know, they've long stopped talking to me. And I'm such a public face for this that, you know, uh, there was no, uh, there was no smooth transition. You know, I I just, I just had to tear the bandaid off and and, and be that guy and, and see where, what happened from there. And most people aren't going to do that and, uh, you know, probably shouldn't, you know, and can play things more cautiously and, and walk people through it uh, uh, more diplomatically than I did. And I'd really like to know their stories. But uh, sometimes being the center of the storm, it, even though it gives you a bigger picture of everything that's that's going on and, and you know, uh, from the broad perspective, I, I probably have the best overview of TST, but on some of the nuances, I'm the uh, I'm the least likely guy to talk about it, you know, because it, it's just not it's not the experience I've had with this. And now I'm very comfortable with just being the guy that people recognize as the Satanist because I feel liberated from that, you know. I, I don't have any sense like. Ah, well, things are going to be different when they find out about this, you know, <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm long already there. But there, there's, there's forum groups, you know, with TST, and there's a big community now, and a lot of people have these types of discussions. And, uh, and you know, you might be able to find them, but also I think 
it's kind of my duty at this point to put together those kinds of anecdotes from people to help other people out because it is a big issue. I'm curious, are you, do you feel like you're being a coward or disingenuous if you don't just come out and tell your family? I mean, do, do you feel compelled to just sort of let the cat out of the bag? What drives your desire to have that conversation? Yeah, I'm, I'm really passionate about the things that the Satanic Temple has been doing. And I, I, you know, I want them to be able to understand that, uh, you know, I obviously don't believe in a literal Satan. Um, but, um, you know, I, I want to see positive change. And uh, the temple has been a liberating experience for me. But um, it, it's frustrating to me because I don't think that they will be able to understand it from that point of view. Um, they're, they're extremely religious, very fundamentalist. Um, you know, and I, I grew up in that, that, that whole environment as a kid. So, uh, all my, all my close friends and uh, all the, most of the people I know, know me and identify me as, as you know, somebody who's really passionate about that stuff, but I have never discussed it with my family. To what Seth said, I just want it to be known that I never question anybody's decision, uh, whether they come out openly or decide that they need to, to lay low for now. Um, if somebody feels like there's, they're going to be a pariah in their community or it's going to harm their job or their family isn't ready for it yet. I mean, I, I just tell them to trust their instincts there, you know, look for the opening, consider how, you know, all their options and their availability and things like that. Um, but, you know, the more of us there are out in the open, the easier it is for all of us too. So it's definitely worth considering when you can best get to that point. But if you're not there, you're not there. Yeah. If you're not sure, definitely, you know, I would just play that you're playing chess, not checkers. I mean, like if I, somebody who was going into a job interview in the state of Alabama and I, you know, I would not walk in wearing Satanist on my sleeve. I just think, plus your journey is really more about you <laughs> and your value system. You don't have to impress anybody else. So, you know, if, if you decide to take yeah. and play a longer game, I think everybody would understand. But, you know, be, living an authentic life, I think that's yeah. what we desire for everyone. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was hard enough for them when I came out as an atheist. So. <laughs> I mean, you know, I I think only you can make the decision, but follow Lucian's uh, Twitter feed and maybe uh, the Satanic Temple forums, and maybe at, as those get populated with these conversations, maybe there'll be some resources that we could not provide, okay? Yeah, thank you. I right, appreciate it. Thanks for calling. You got time for a few more, Lucian? You doing okay? Yeah, yeah, no Monopolize problem. Monopolize your time. That's what I do. Here's one from my hometown. In Oklahoma, in Tulsa, I've got 918. Who's this? It's Corey from Tulsa. Corey, you and I, we yes. are moments from Rama Bible Training Center, Oral Roberts yep. University, about 350 churches in the city limits, and yet here we are. Mm-hmm. So what's on your mind today? Yep. Well, I, I really called to touch on the QAnon aspect of the satanic panic, and I wanted to know what are some strategies that we've learned from the satanic panic that we can put towards kind of debunking or pulling people away from the QAnon phenomenon. phenomenon. It, it, it seems to be the new panic, um, whereas in the 80s there was a devil under every bed, now there's a, there's a ch- child rapist under every bed. And if you disagree with them online, you're a child rapist. Well, I think the, uh, I mean, I think just that acknowledgement brings us a long way from the uh, previous 1980s, 1990s satanic panic to the QAnon manifestation now. Uh, the, uh, that tactic has served organizations like the ISSTD, which I spoke about earlier, very well. That evasion by saying that, uh, you know, by implying that if you're questioning Illuminati conspiracy theories or mind control conspiracy theories, uh, their theories about uh, fractured personalities and repressed memories, that you're merely defending pedophiles, uh, that has actually served to keep people from questioning a lot of their key assumptions and a lot of their pseudoscience for a very long time. And I'm actually optimistic at this point that with QAnon, 
hijacking Save the Children, that this will really provide a tipping point where people will say, okay, well, it's not enough to just say that we need to believe every claim of abuse uh, because to not do so is, is further abusing people or calling into question all claims of abuse. It's just not true. Um, when you're really attaching conspiracy theories to real problems like child sexual abuse, you're not serving the victims in any way whatsoever. You're really, you, you know, when you're attaching conspiracy theories to those kinds of claims, uh, that's really doing more to uh, discredit the work of real people who are really trying to work as victim advocates. And, and just saying that we'll, we'll believe anything that comes at us really diminishes the claims of people who have actually suffered abuse. And, and it, it really discredits them. And you really have to see them as using victims of abuse as human shields. But what I really hope happens is that people do recognize the similarity, the intellectual similarity between the uh, delusional maniacs spouting QAnon conspiracy theories online and the mental health professionals who use pseudoscience to bolster those delusional claims and do it in a professional setting and under the authority of mental health licensing boards. I'm thinking that, you know, hopefully QAnon has taken it too far to the point that we'll be able to dismantle the ongoing remnants of the satanic panic completely. To speak to part of this question about changing minds, if somebody's made an emotional attachment to this narrative of the conspiracy, do facts matter? Do facts make a dent? I mean, you and I aren't psychologists, but we've done a lot of conversations about religion, atheism, Satanism, whatever. What's your perspective, Lucian Greaves? I think when you're talking to people individually, you need to address what they're talking about, and tell them why they're wrong, and assume that they can see things for the reality of what they are. Uh, based upon the evidence given to them, and that's apparent. Um, when I talk about the, these things in broad strokes, and I'm not speaking to anybody directly, I'm very open with the fact that I think QAnon, the whole premise of QAnon is irredeemably stupid. And I, I, I subject it to ridicule and mockery. And, you know, people will tell me, of course, that they feel that that's not the way to do it. That you don't change minds doing that. And I'm not so sure. I'm not sure any one thing changes people's minds. But I'm, I also don't think it's a, it's a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination that people who are subscribing to QAnon see that there are people saying, this is incredibly stupid and this makes no sense. Uh, because I wouldn't want... Uh, the large QAnon population thinking that their claims are being taken seriously on some intellectual level as to the degree that they're actually engaging in a serious political dialogue. Um, I think that uh, kind of this multifaceted approach works best. You need to be able to kind of engage with people and take their claims seriously as something they actually believe in and that they can be corrected on. But I also don't think you want to pull punches when you're evaluating overall uh, the intellectual uh, uh, legitimacy of any claims. By the way, irredeemably stupid is my new favorite term for the week. Like, I'm going to apply that. It's irredeemably stupid. Do you have any other comment or question before I move on, my friend? Seth, thank you so much for the birthday wishes this morning. You were the first one to wish me happy birthday. I appreciate it. Happy birthday, brother. Take care of yourself. Hey, be good. All right. Take care of the dogs and cats. Bye-bye. Uh, let's do like two more quickly. Uh, I've got on Skype, looks like an international call, 4-9. Hi, who's this? Hey, hi, this is, uh, this is Jay. I'm calling from Germany. And uh, Seth, Lucian, it's great to talk to you. Um, my question is... Uh, it kind of has to do with the freedom, uh, the military freedom from religion foundation, and uh, maybe your goals. Uh, I'm over here as a civilian employee of the uh, the army, 
And, uh, you know, there's a, a, a really big um, religious uh, <laughs> uh, factor in military service, especially in the Air, uh, Air Force. And I was just kind of wondering if, uh, you know, the Satanic Temple had any plans for any, uh, any activity regarding the military. I'm trying to see, like, I am myself am trying to figure out what that even looks like. Um, I'm sorry, Lucian, go ahead. Forgive me. Yeah, uh, right now we have, uh, we have a group for military uh, active and ex, ex-military uh, in the Satanic Temple. And we have, it's, it seems to me, we've, we've attracted a lot of military membership. And uh, I think I know why, but I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure uh, overall, honestly. Um, in right from the very beginning, we attracted uh, the defense of veterans from foreign wars. And when there would be public statements available uh, to open to the public uh, in public settings, even when we would be asking city councils to give an invocation or whatever else, you know, we get a lot of people standing up from churches and getting pissed and saying we had no right to speak and things like that. And it was always, you know, veterans of foreign wars who would get up and say that that they fought for the right of anybody to be able to speak of any religion, didn't matter, and all that kind of thing. And I just think that those are the values that get instilled in people, I guess, when they go overseas and are interacting with different cultures and, and really develop a respect for the idea of pluralism and a respect for the ideals that they're ideally supposed to be fighting for. Um, right now, all we're really doing is trying to develop that kind of uh, that group of, of military people that we have. We in West Point, I think it was, um, you know, the uh, uh, members of the Satanic Temple wanted to put together a study group, and that turned into a big bit of controversy. But they 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 managed to get that together. So I think. Uh, I think that in the beginning here, it's probably going to be essential more than more than our intervention is going to be uh, essential. The uh, activities of military personnel within their groups themselves, within the military themselves, are going to be important. They're going to have to ask for uh, their right to to congregate as members of the Satanic Temple. They're going to have to ask for the same accommodations, religious co- accommodations, as any. Uh, as, as any soldier or military personnel, and uh, they're, they're going to have to be respected on that. And of course, we're open to communication and uh, very willing to speak with legal counsel when people run into problems in that regard. But for the most part, the military should be really clear about the legal aspects of how they treat different religions within their personnel. That answer your question, sir? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I was kind of thinking more along the lines of the, uh, uh, there's a big evangelical, um, I'm trying to, trying to phrase this diplomatically, a big evangelical uh, following in the, in the higher ups of the Air Force. Um, and yeah, I was just, yeah. So I, you're I guess talking I, about like the hand over heart, question. God and country, we're doing God's good work, probably the Christian God kind well, of culture. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the, the commander of the unit says, hey, we're going to have a prayer breakfast, and I expect to see every one of you here, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Military Freedom from Religion Foundation, they've been, they've been writing a lot of letters and, and doing a lot of stuff, but I just wasn't sure if there was a, uh, you know, if there was a, a temple chapter for uh, military or overseas. So yeah, I guess, I guess it does answer the question. Yeah, yeah, th- there there is, and uh, but uh, I think uh, our role in that, yeah, is is uh, is different from the Military Freedom from Religion Foundation. That they should really be fighting those fights to make sure that your uh, commanding officers aren't trying to impose their religious beliefs and practices upon you. Um, that goes a bit. Uh, a bit easier, I think, if you're openly identifying as, as another religion, uh, you know, uh, then maybe you don't even get approached. I'm not sure. But uh, 
you know, there again, like with the, the question we had earlier, a guy coming out with his fam- to his family, I don't know all of everything that somebody's dealing with within within uh, within their military unit, within whatever whatever they're wherever they're placed. Um, so, I mean, that that's definitely something to think about. But uh, but uh, you know, the West the West Point group, I think, uh, was going strong, and, and you know, they had controversy at first. But uh, usually, when you when you have your rights established. In, in something that the government's operating, you know, you, you'll be respected uh, after it's in place. So you know, it might, it might be hard sort of get recognized at first, but once you are, you probably won't, won't run into any problems. A lot of these folks are kind of pioneering some of this stuff. And what's that phrase that says or that, that the line that says the first person through the wall always gets bloody, you know, and that's often happens with trailblazers. Thanks so much for calling on the show. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. A one seven. Thanks for waiting on me. Hi, who's this? Hey, this is Chris, a uh, longtime fan of the show. I actually grew up in Oklahoma, uh, out in Perkins. Oh, really? Just outside the Stillwater. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Well, um, we have a comment or question for Lucian Greaves of the Satanic Temple today. I do. I actually have two. One of the ones that I wanted to know was, are there any systems for becoming ordained for the satanic temple? Since I promised my cousin that I'd actually officiate his wedding if he ever did, since he is, uh, since he is gay. So I, I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Uh, before the year is up, our ordination, uh, program will be, uh, taking applicants. Um, we have a website set up for uh, the forthcoming ordination program, satanicministry.org or .com, I don't remember. Um, sorry. But but you, you'll definitely find it. And we're putting together coursework. Uh, it's, not, it's not one of those things where you'll pay a fee and get a certificate. Uh, we're actually going to take applicants and either approve or deny those applicants based on the criteria we, we set up, which we haven't fully uh, uh, agreed upon yet. Um, but it's uh, going to be online coursework, and I'm filming one of the last lectures for it within the next couple of weeks here. And uh, we expect people to be able to pass tests uh, based on the coursework they, te- they take um, so that we can be sure that uh, our ministry are accurate representatives of what we believe and understand uh, understand what we do and what we don't do uh, sometimes is more important uh, overall. Um, but that, yeah, keep, keep on the lookout for that. That's on its way. What was your second question? Awesome. Uh, the other question I had was kind of for both of you. Uh, whenever friends or family, like my family's very religious. So whenever they find out that I am a Satanist, it's the Christian equivalent of swearing with the bless your heart. No, you're not, you know, Lord save you type things. Uh, how do you deescalate some of those things? Like in your, in your lives, since either Satanism or atheism are effectively the equivalent in their eyes. Yeah, I, I mean, it depends on the mood I'm in. You know, I, I can get pretty snarky with that kind of thing. I, uh, as an atheist slash humanist, I like to go in and start with my value system. It's kind of a redirect or a misdirect, but I'm like, all right, well, I believe that human life is precious. And I believe that, you know, we should, not judge people by the color of their skin. And I believe that we should work together as a society to cooperate, to do all these things. I mean, I just, I'm, I, I at the time will go through sort of a list of humanistic values that Christians often like to grab and co-opt and say that they own all goodness, love, kindness, charity, cooperation, uh, uh, cooperation, community, etc. And then I'm like, well, you know, these are actually values of, of humanism. 
I'd be curious to see what it would look like to go in and say, well, you know, these are the values that I hold. And then you rattle off many of sort of the, uh, I don't know, does the satanic temple have like tenants or a list of values or something, Lucian? Do you, like a statement of values? Yes, we do. Yeah, we have. We have seven tenants. All right. So you would go in and essentially be like, you know, don't be shitty to other people. Um, you know, do this, do that, which are really mer meritorious notions. And then you'd be like, do you agree with those? And they say, yeah. And I'm like, well, okay, well, that's interesting because you just agreed with the se seven tenets of the satanic temple. I just watch the reaction. I mean, I'm not saying you should do that at a family picnic, but it just, I think it's an interesting social experiment to do that. I don't engage much with the bless your heart crowd. Quite frankly, I always remember that internet meme that said inside every bless your heart, there is a teeny tiny fuck you. And if they're going to take that tone with me, I, I just I just nod and smile and be like, you know what? You guys believe in the Talking Animals book. You guys go do your thing. I'm going to go focus on my own journey. I don't waste a lot of my time or oxygen on those folks, okay? Yeah, awesome. Thank you, guys. I right, appreciate and you. Especially thank you for the, uh, the ritual abortion in Missouri. That was awesome. Have a good thank one. Thank you. All right, I need more, Lucian, before we wrap it up. Ritual abortion. What? What was he talking about? Well, all right, this is a whole topic, but I'll, I'll summarize. This is a whole other show. Uh, <laughs> well, well, the thing is, is we have, uh, you know, we were we had a uh, lawsuits in Missouri against abortion restrictions. Um, there's a period, and they had ultrasound things like that. And for the most part, the courts evaded uh, really ruling on it at all. You know, they, they tried to, they, they, they've been looking at procedure. We're, we're appealing to the sort of Supreme Court. But in the intervening time where we were saying that, uh, here's what happened. In Missouri, uh, there was a member of the Satanic Temple. She wanted to get an abortion. And she goes into a clinic and they have a mandatory waiting period. And in that waiting period, they're supposed to consider the state mandated literature that tells them by law that life begins at conception and that abortion, having an abortion will kill a unique uh, individual human being. And we don't believe that. So we felt that be having that information imposed upon our membership was a violation of our, our own religious liberty. And plus, it, it uh, you know, it came with that waiting period uh, on an abortion, you know, uh, to, to put those kinds of, um, uh, to, to, to just put that re religious propaganda on us that we felt that uh, we should be able to be exempted from that kind of waiting period. Anyways, that's the case we're taking the Supreme Court as the, uh, as the Eighth Circuit really kind of refused to review it and, and evaded, evaded the, the substantial questions entirely. But while those cases were playing out, uh, there were members of the Satanic Temple who developed a, a ritual, which was kind of uh, something to, uh, kind of a counseling ritual in, in, in a way, to people who were going to terminate their pregnancies. Uh, something that put things in the context of the satanic perspective, talked people through it, uh, kind of uh, turned it into more of this kind of uh, uh, self-affirming process, you know, to, to, to help them kind of really kind of digest their decision, understand it, and be okay with it before going through with it. It's an abortion ritual. So... Being that abortions in the satanic context have taken on this ritual component for those who are going to do the abortion ritual, it's our understanding that anything done to kind of uh, encroach upon the timing of that ritual and the exercise of that ritual is very much unquestionable a uh an encroachment upon our religious liberty to practice as we see fit and so we feel that next time around if we're going into the courts and we're saying that you know the waiting period uh 
or you know burial rites or fetal ultrasounds or anything like that uh, they don't play a role in our abortion ritual and therefore the state mandating those types of things really really imposes itself upon us we think we really have a strong religious liberty case um, in the future so that's what that's all about we we announced this that you know this abortion ritual is a thing in that you know uh, members of the satanic temple self-identifying satanists who are going to get an abortion who have done this or are going to do this uh, really should be exempted legally from any of these weasel bills being put forward by uh, theocrats who are just trying to stop abortion and I think that's going to be a very contentious legal battle ahead but that's something you can look forward to from us okay there's another phrase weasel bills Oh, yeah, I like that. I'm going to make a note of that. Okay. I've kept you about 20 minutes longer than I expected. I appreciate you being so generous with your time. Let me come back to the title of the freaking show and ask you this final question. Do you think, I don't know, you pick whatever incarnation of Satan you want to. Satan looks around at the state of the United States and the world today, this tendency toward authoritarianism, you can call it tyranny, anti-science, conspiracy thinking, theocratic overreach, the fucking circus of 2020 United States and the world. And Satan was to see that. What do you think Satan would say and do about all of it? Well, on the one hand, you look at the rising theocracy and you think this is horrific. We're turning back to a new dark ages. But if you're if you're looking at it from the perspective of a Satanist, if you're Satan and you're looking at this, this makes you relevant. This is a world of opportunity. This makes Satan a force to be reckoned with again. This makes uh, this, this makes uh, the battleground present, and and it makes it, it makes the fight so much more legitimate, and it, the stakes are so high that you, you, you know you have to be in on this. You know, you, you know that this, this is a defining battle uh, that's going to be relevant for uh, unseen generations ahead and that there is no standing down now and that you're in it 100% or you're not. And I like to think that we've cultivated a sense of values and nobility in people to the point that they're in it 100%. And we're going to be in it to the last. And it's going to be a hard, horrific fight. And many battles will be lost. But I think ultimately we'll be vindicated. And hopefully uh, having to go through all this again uh, will have us in a much better place in some future when we've gotten this all resolved. And and we can take uh, our share of the credit for uh for, for bringing a certain sense of balance back. Lucian Greaves, co-founder of the Satanic Temple, an intriguing organization worth following alone for the legal battle going on over the monument in Arkansas. That, that alone for me is a reason to follow and subscribe moment by moment because it's awesome. Lucian, I appreciate you so much. It's always a fascinating and interesting conversation, and we will uh, hook up with you and talk soon, okay? Great. Thank you.